Okay, I'll give people a minute or two to swing back here. Okay, so I know we have a lot of community agencies, but I think it's valuable and to have some parent perspectives to that have gone through these processes and um, applied for these things, maybe get denied, maybe some struggles throughout that. So I, I wanted to have a few kind of family perspectives um, so that hopefully other people can you know, maybe ask some questions or find some encouragement or things like that. Um, on Chi and Kwang, I think it's only you <laughs> at a parent back out. Uh, Juliana oh, said really? she may or may not be on here earlier, but I have I have Juliana's responses kind of summarized on some of the next slides. So um, I'll put the prompt up in a okay. bit. Um, and then I have some of Juliana's responses, but uh, kind of in terms of live, it's, it's you two. So, so like I said, I kind of wanted to get some parents' perspectives of people that have gone through a lot of these things, whether it's DDA, um, you know, eventually school to work, um, just different areas of guardianship or other aspects and navigating some of the community opportunities, whether it's it, the Alyssa Burnett Center, I almost said ABC, but um, I, <laughs> I need to spell it out for people that right. are familiar. Um, and just other opportunities. So I've got at least a pair of parents here. Um, you want to introduce yourselves and then I can go to the questions. Okay. Um, Huang, do you want to go first? Or? Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, my name is Lan Chi Fan and um married to Kwang Lee, my husband here. Um, our daughter, Ilan, um is 18 now. And she's actually in the first year of adult transition to independence program, which she's loving and it, and it's really been great. Um, she was diagnosed with autism at, it took about four and a half years is when we, they were able to get a diagnosis. You know, back then we had to get in a lot of waiting lists and things like that. Um, anyway, um, uh, so Kwong, <laughs> do you want to say anything? Yes. So, um, Elang, uh, like uh, Langi was saying, uh, she's in the first year transition program, you know, and Corbin is uh, her teacher. Uh, she's also a DDA client, and uh, she also received, uh, you know, SSA benefits through my work record. You know, if uh, you don't have that, uh, uh, you know, if you are not uh, applying to Social Security, you know, to your earning records, then uh, uh, the best way to go is to, to apply for SSI for her and, uh, you know, him or her. And uh, she also attended, uh, you know, the uh, Alyssa Burnett Center one day a week, and she planned to do it, uh, I think we plan to do it three to four days this summer. And uh, we also apply for her, you know, uh, SNAP benefits, uh, uh, the food benefits. So, um, you know, that's our, um, um, basically, uh, you know, all the things that we did uh, for, uh, with respect to Ilan. So we'd be happy to share our experience with uh, anybody who has, who has questions. Yeah. And um, with regard to DDA, she basically, when she was diagnosed with autism, um, we did a birth to three before that. And that organization, uh, we went through Kindring and they helped us get her into a transition kindergarten. And the advocate there, the social worker, basically, um, they had told me that you'll want to get her involved with DDA, regardless if you're going to receive services or not. And at that time, we would we did not receive any services for a very, very long time um, until maybe the last couple years. Uh, and it's been very, uh, very helpful. Um, they have helped us with like some respite care. So during the pandemic and before, I was able to, because both Kwang and I were working and we needed someone to take care of Elon. But, um, and so we were able to, uh, through DDA, get some re respite services that was helpful. And then they also um, help with, you know, a lot of resources in terms of uh, where you can go to, to participate in things and um, 
also other type of resources. Um, so that's been really great. And then when she turned 18, um, the caseworker, her case manager did give me advice because, uh, you know, a little bit of advice um, in terms of like, you know, when she, she needs to apply um, for SSI, uh, you want to contact them like the month of her birth date. So you can start getting that process that's going. But that process for us was a little challenging because um, uh, even if you have information on a website and you're reading it, um, it's hard to understand. You know, I mean, I wasn't born here, but I I, I understand English pretty well, but of uh, the verbiage they use. And so, uh, but the people at SSI, everyone that we've ever talked to, they've been very, very, they're very, very nice and very helpful. It's just, I, I think that it's just, uh, there's just so many people and, um, you know, not a lot of uh, staff. Yeah, that, that process, uh, I think um, you should give yourself uh, at least six months uh, from start to finish. And, you know, if you are organized with all your medical records and, uh, you know, the e, uh, the IEPs and all the, all the paperwork, then it may be a little bit shorter, but the government just will take, just, they just take a long time. It's just, uh, it's uh, fairly tough to navigate. Yeah, we, um, luckily at the time when we applied, um, they, there was a, so they never got back to us because we reached out by email saying we need, because there was an option, we need help to understand what the process is. And they never got back to us. So then we we uh, reached out, uh, we went back to the website because I heard that you could apply online because we actually took a class through maybe, um, was it the ARC? Uh, someone was offering a class. And so they uh, we took that and then we went onto the website and at that time we could apply online. So we started the process online and it literally took me very many days to sit down and fill out all the paperwork for like from when she was born till recent of all her providers, all the therapies, um, giving them all this contact information so that it's easier for them to reach out to the right people in order to get the medical records in order to for them to determine that she has a disability. Um, and that process took quite a while. But um, finally, she was um, approved for three months for SSI, <laughs> because um, um, after that, we did the child benefit. Um, like Kwan was saying, where it's, it's against Kwan's work record because he's now retired. Yeah, thanks for sharing some of those experiences there. And I think it's valuable. And I'm going to put some of the uh, prompts here that I just kind of came up with, but I, you know, allowing them to anybody to share kind of, you know, on their, on their own thoughts. But I think the other cool thing, um, that I've learned is that, you know, you two as a family have connected with other families to kind of support each other, right? And just yes. kind yes, of, yeah. I think that's so, been a good, good thing. Maybe just speak on that for, I don't have that as a prompt, but speak sure. on that for a little bit. Um, well, um, since Elon, uh, so we just basically, you know, since she was in special education, since she was, you know, three years old and we started to meet up with families that were going through the same journey. And so Elon has a group of friends now that they're very close and she's known them since she was like a baby practically. And um, the moms and the families, we really try to support each other. We're trying to share information as much as we can with each other. And also just being sounding board, um, we also keep our kids together and advocate very hard for our kids at whatever school we're at, because although, you know, inclusion is huge and people want to work on that, um, it's been challenging. Um, and if I didn't, you know, if we didn't have other family members to lean on or other people to uh, talk about things with or, or hear information about, it would have been even harder. And so, um, we really appreciate that we have a, a a group of friends that she's known since she was young. And now also as we're going into, as she gets older, you know, we're meeting new friends um, that are, are older or um, they have different experiences and they've been sharing information with us. Um, 
Um, and so it's that's been really great. Really appreciate that. Yeah, thank, thanks for sharing some of that. Okay, um, I just have like just a general question I was thinking of, you know, what have you learned throughout the process and some 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 of this you kind of shared and responded to in terms of advocating and finding support and resources for your children or child and student. Then I can read Juliana's response afterwards. Whatever Juliana said, <laughs> basically, uh, yeah. Um, what have we learned? It's yeah, being persistent and just uh, keep advocating. It's um, if they if you they don't if you don't ask you won't you won't know. Um, for our example, it's like Elon love being involved with tons of sports throughout her whole school life. And um, we went to Woodmore and they luckily, they had two special ed teachers or three, however many that were there, they they were the coaches for all the sports. So then, you know, it was like natural to have the whole school, any kids can be involved with that. Um, as we moved into uh, middle school and high school, that was a little more challenging. So uh, basically, we would just reach out directly to the coaches, you know, let them know um, what, you know, if you want to participate in this particular sport um, and also talk with her teachers and paraeducators. And they they were very uh, great at making sure they provided a support for her if we couldn't be there because basically it was, you know, Huang, myself, or even um, we would sometimes have therapists that we would hire that would just be with Elon at activities and events just to help, um, you know, to support her and give her advocacy since um, part of her, some of her challenges are uh, speech and language challenges. Um, but it's, it's just, yeah, just, just basically you have to ask, even if it's not there, you just ask and, um, most of the time, the the uh, you know teachers, administrators, or whoever they will they will be there to support and work with you. Uh, we've been I feel that we've been really blessed to be in this school district because it's been great. I mean, uh, we've had challenges, but for the most part, um, we've had really good good support. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So another parent. Um, that couldn't be your mentioned persistence, knowing your stuff. So just kind of doing some research, like asking some questions, um, collaborating, being flexible. Um, you know, as mentioned a few times, uh, it takes time. Some of it requires a lot of waiting, might not go your way. Um, and then I think this was a good one that was mentioned by the parents said, just take time for yourself, right? Like there's a lot of work into researching, applying, advocating. And so take time for yourself. I think that was a, you know, one that was pretty valuable. Um, and remembering that your voice uh, matters throughout this process. So um, next question, you know, I, I just kind of have is like, what are some things you wish you knew maybe when child was younger? I think you touched on a little bit of things, uh, but anything you want to, Add in terms of like maybe one or two things you wish you knew when Lon was younger. Um, I think that would, I guess, um, having a roadmap is always good, but not, I guess, not knowing where to find it. Um, I I did encounter. I mean, I met a parent when that when Elon was younger, um, at the elementary school, and they had just moved from California, and she was really confused on you know, what resources are there for her, her child, um, things like that. And, and in California, apparently they have the system they had for, for instance, her son had autism. They had it all planned out and their, so their support structure was quite tight. I think in terms of like, you know, uh, she knew where he was going to be. I mean, in terms of what else you had to do. So it's like, you know, having a pathway and, when you when she came here, she did say that it was very hard to find resources and or she found them. It was sort of disparate and and 
and so like we just had to meet and talk with others and so that was that was really hard um I think um I would understand I I we went through that as well um um yeah I mean <laughs> uh Huang, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think the support network is really important. You know, like, um, you know, Juliana, she's, she's part of the mom squad. That she is. <laughs> yeah. to, you know, so um, um, because, you know, you, you cannot know everything. So you somebody would know something that you don't know and you, you share you share information, you know. So uh, that is really, really valuable, the, the support. And uh, we were, you know, very fortunate that uh, in, from the very beginning, pretty much, you know, when Elan was like almost four years old and then we met these uh, group of moms that, uh, you know, we became a part of like a community for us. So that is just so, so, you know, I can, uh, uh, you know, emphasize that enough. The support, you really need the support because it it is really hard to do it all on your own, so. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate that. And it aligns with what Juliana mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other thing, and I've heard this feedback too, is kind of understanding the special education language, um, you know, especially, especially as this parent mentions as an immigrant, kind of adds the layer of challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are things that we try to be mindful of and, and support. So, okay, the last question, um, we kind of covered this a little bit too, is, you know, you all are sharing great things. It's just kind of any ongoing or current challenges that you're finding right now? I know some you said waiting, but are there other things? I guess, um, um, go ahead. Yeah, for me, I mean, you know, I um, right now she, she, you know, she has a very good support system. Um, the program, the ATI program is great and, you know, it's going good for her. And then we we, we uh, participate in some upside stuff. You know, she, she has an old therapist. Uh, you know, we go to the, the hopeful hands for some activities. We go to the Alyssa Burnett. Uh, what I feel the most is when she turned 21 and a lot of that is like kind of, you know, the the support is, it's not quite as good when, you know, I mean, so that's a biggest fear. Uh, so basically, uh, just, you know, keep, keep up at night. Say, well, when she, what, what happened when she turned 21? I mean, you know, we learned about the, the, the school to work program and the DVR today. I mean, we didn't even know, we, we've been in this for a while, but we didn't even know about this, not too much. I mean, you know, we heard of it, but we don't know the detail until today. But uh, and, and Corbin did send uh, yeah so Corbin sent us some information recently so that'd be that's great yeah yeah I agree yeah because like Huang saying you um they kind of age out of certain programs so the ABC is great because they could she could go there as long she's an adult so she is eighteen to adult forever so that's awesome um she does go to Young Life Capernaum and um that is a you know a Young Life a youth group. Uh, for kids with spec for people with special needs and she will age out at 22 for that and so we're thinking of what other things she can do and I in terms of talking with the leader there um, there's opportunities for her to volunteer and be a part of that still so that'll be good but yes uh, the concern is that and then also I know that she you know, in terms of transitioning to independence, really independence, like she does want to live on her own. And so we'll have to figure that out, how that's going to look if it, you know, I, I joke around with the, our group of moms that maybe what we're just going to have to do, and actually not really a joke, but we, we've been talking about it. Maybe we'll just have to um, have a house and all our kids can just live there and we can take turns um, checking in on them and you know, we'll, we'll figure something out. Yeah, I've heard of some other families in something similar to that in some regards. Yeah, we're the friends, peers living together and mm -hmm. people are kind of teaming up and checking in, yeah. Yeah, and one one other thing we, have, we forgot to mention is that, uh, you know, uh, I think her name was uh, Denise. I think it was the lawyer that uh, that talked earlier. Yeah, it's very important to get the legal stuff that you know, swear away as well. Yeah, we did go to different attorney, but yeah, we we did uh, have uh, the power attorney, a durable power attorney set up for her. So um, you know, we highly encourage you know all the parents to do that as well. I mean, you know, uh, one way or the other, either the guardianship or the power attorney, because uh, one once your uh, child turns eighteen, then uh, you can't even look at the the medical records anymore unless you right. have. Yeah, and that that was the primary reason that uh, you know we wanted to, because even even talking to the insurance company, I had to 
uh, send them a copy of her, um, her DPOA so that they're like, oh, you can talk on her behalf, even though I'm the guarantor for the insurance, right? So it's, yes, that's a very good thing to have. Yeah. Yeah, good point there. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then I'll wrap up as we transition here. Uh, Juliana mentioned one of the challenges is just finding places uh, for a son to learn and grow, especially with the interests of animation and some of the sensory needs. Um, and then as kind of a, along the theme of waiting, some long wait lists for certain therapies um, that that might be the case. And then um, kind of along the lines of what was just mentioned, but just transitioning from different levels, whether it's high school to ATI, high school to this or ATI and beyond. And just it's kind of a um, challenge or concern around meeting some of the needs, interests, you know, so sensory supports and any of the, you know, electives or school based things. So, yeah. So, yeah, again, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to have some family share. So, I appreciate that. Thank you both. And um, Thank you. we'll definitely kind of continue some of these. And hopefully, some of that time was valuable to hear from people that have some of these lived experiences that, um, you know, that I think are, and again, I'm, I'm biased, but they're, they're great team members and they're great to collaborate with. So I, I, you know, I appreciate them always asking questions and, um, you know, bringing things up and seeing if we can do some things and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a really healthy team approach. So I, I definitely appreciate that from you and all the families that I had invited on there. So, um, okay, we are transitioning to the college section here, and I believe I saw, I think I'd be up for Sarah, so <clears throat> did you want me to share screen, or should I? I can share. Okay, so let me unshare here for a second. Okay, so like I said, we're transitioning to the Kind of section of colleges and um, call it you know college resources here. So, I'm gonna let Sarah introduce them. There you go, ready, ready to go. Sorry, take it away. You got it. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm here to talk about. Neurodiversity Navigators, which is part of the RISE Learning Institute at Bellevue College. I am Sarah Sanders Gardner. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm the director and the um, designer of the program. So, um, oh, is this my first slide? I guess it is. Okay. Um, so who are our students? Who are the students who are in our program? Our students are um, Bellevue College students who are taking any program of study at the college and they identify as neurodivergent or autistic. They do not need to have documentation of disability um, and they need to assess into English 072 or above. So there's English 072, English 092, and then English 101 is college level English. So that's the, the English that they need to assess into is English 072. It's about a sixth grade reading level, more or less. The most important go. thing is that the student themselves has to want to participate in so all the programs. Back on the left side, there's a volume thing. And they need to be they need to be taking at least one other class in addition to the classes in our program. So I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, we started in 2011 with 18 students. We now um, last last fall we had or last summer we had 93 incoming students. We have over 150 students in our program. And our students are doing really well in their overall college um, class courses as a cohort, as a group, they're experiencing their earning um, a 3.0 grade point average um, over the last 10 years. And they've completed 85% of the courses that they attempt, which is really good because uh, to have satisfactory academic progress, you have to complete 67% of your courses. And they stay, we have about a 90% fall to fall retention. So they keep coming back to college. Um, the framework that we follow is um, 
we make sure that we have certain things infused to our whole entire program. We focus on strengths. Uh, we support students in discovering their strengths uh, and using those strengths, building on those strengths. We have a social justice, intersectionality, and identity development. So we believe all of our students deserve equal rights and opportunities and supports to education and um, developing their identity, uh, both as a disabled person and all of the other identities that they have. We use universal design in our courses and in our other interactions with students as an educational best practice um, because it results in motivated, goal-directed, and knowledgeable learners. We also use a um, problem-solving technique you may have heard about, which is called collaborative problem-solving. It's research-based to increase flexibility, improve frustration tolerance, improve executive functioning skills, and build problem-solving skills across settings. You can learn more about it at thinkkids.org. It works with anyone age three and up, including non-speaking students. Um, I have uh, been using it for well over 20 years and I'm a huge fan of it. We also infuse positive psychology into our interactions and our courses with our students. This is another research-based um, thing that is research-based to decrease symptoms of depression and improve mood across populations. So our strength-based focus focuses on four areas, self-advocacy. Our students are always learning how to advocate for themselves and their advocacy skills grow every quarter that they're with us. Executive functioning, social interaction, not social skills, but how do they um, prefer to socially interact? What barriers are they experiencing? How can they advocate for those barriers or find ways to um, support themselves with those barriers and then self-regulation? And there's four components to our program. We have cohort career preparation classes. Um, I think someone else um, noted that like their goal is that students be career ready when they leave college. And that's absolutely our goal as well. So we have a series of courses that start the summer before they start their full course load with a first year seminar course that is of all the students who are coming in that year. And that, that course is designed to get them ready for college. And then they have a course that they take alongside their other courses that is for their degree path. And we have students coming in at all different levels and pursuing all different degrees or certificates at the college. Then they also have peer mentoring where they meet with a peer um, who is usually a junior or senior from a nearby college who is pursuing a degree in psychology, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, et cetera. We also provide parent training and support so, um, so that parents can network, work with each other and also get some um, information about being the parent of an adult who is likely still living at home since we are a community college, and then faculty and staff training and support as well. This is a quote from a student who said, I could feel like I can finally gain back what I lost. I can finally feel that desire again, that passion of a goal that was not set by a teacher nor by a therapist or by my parents, but by me and me alone. And what is more is that I feel like I can reach that goal as though it is right in front of me waiting. So we have our final Q&A information session, Monday, June 17th. There's a video on our website that you should watch prior to that, or your student should watch prior to that. The student must apply to Bellevue College by June 14th. Um, Bellevue College is an open access institution, so a student needs to be either 18 or have a GED or a high school diploma. Um, they must request an appointment with us by June 21st, and then our required summer course starts July 1st and runs through August 14th. And you can find our future student checklist um, by going to the link found at this QR code. This deck is uploaded on the Google um, Doc that uh, Corbin gave you all. So that is all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, again, so that's the Neurodiversity Navigators program over at Bellevue College. And I believe I've got, I saw you earlier, Justin from the Occupational Life Skills program. Hey, everybody. Perfect. 
Do you want me to share or you want to share? Uh, do you mind sharing, Corbin? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, again, uh, Justin Sanders here from the Occupational Life Skills Program at Bellevue College. Um, and I'll we'll click to the first slide here. Oh, there's my slide. I saw your slide and I was like, wait, I don't think that's the one I made. <laughs> uh, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Justin Sanders, and I am not related to Sarah Sanders Gardner, but we do collaborate with each other on occasion. And we both... Um, work in a program for students with disabilities. So it's just kind of fun that we have the last name, same last name. But um, so what I'm gonna be talking to you um, about tonight is the Occupational and Life Skills Program at Bellevue College. Um, it is a different program from Neurodiversity Navigators. And what it is, is it's an actual, actual accredited associate's degree program. So students enter our program and they leave with a college degree in occupational life skills. Um, but just to split back up a little bit and explain my role, um, I'm what's called the student success program manager. Um, typically my um, boss, Pilar Lopez, she's the associate dean of the program, would be presenting, but unfortunately she's not able to be here. So I've been acting as associate dean in her absence. Um, so I'll be sharing with you about OLS tonight. Um, like I said, when students leave us, they have a college degree. Um, a lot of students felt that come to us feel that education has not been accessible to them and they never really thought that they would be able to obtain a college education. And with us, they can. Um, with our program, we focus on really skills for work and skills for life. So um, what you're seeing right here on the screen is an, a highly abridged version, but I'll go into detail on the bullet points. So we teach students skills for, for work, and that um, is mainly in the areas of uh, social communication and executive functioning. A lot of our students struggle with time management. They may struggle with um, planning, organization, and they may struggle with how to express themselves in a way that others can understand and, and in their preferred um, way of communicating. So just on a personal note, something that I've really been moved to see about my students um, since I joined the program about two and a half years ago is that our students want to develop relationships with people. They want to be able to have that human connection and a lot of them just don't know how. Um, and so what we do is we teach them different strategies um, or, or a variety of strategies and they get to choose which one works for them. Um, and even if, for example, none of the ones that we um, that model for them work for them, then maybe they we can help create one for them that works for them. So it's really a student-centered program that taps into their strengths, into their preferences. On that note, you'll notice that the second bullet point is that students get to create their own career path. Um, in terms of like theoretical frameworks and whatnot, we really emphasize self-determination theory at OLS, which when I sum it up for students means you get to call the shots on your life. Um, research shows that a lot of students with disabilities typically um, are told, like this is what you will be able to do based on your disability, based on your IQ, et cetera. But at OLS, um, we let the students know from day one when they interview with us at admissions assessment is actually you get to let us know what you are interested in. What are your strengths? What are your likes? What are your dislikes? And based on that, um, in the fourth year of the program, they get to do an internship in the community. Um, some are paid, some are not paid, but it is an internship based on what they want to do. So we've had students that work at Nintendo for their internship. We've had some students work in manufacturing. We have some students work in childcare. So it really is geared on the student rather than, okay, here's what we have to offer. It's um, We have a dedicated internship program manager who looks for those um, internships in the community. Like I was mentioning, we um, help students to enhance their communication and social skills to um, help them to develop relation, healthy relationships both at work and in life. Um, they were really excited when we added a little bit more curriculum on dating in the intro to communication class just so that they can express their ideas in a healthy in a healthy way that emphasizes consent and that, in con that emphasizes cultural relevance. And so we really do base our, everything we do around our students' needs and their preferences. Like I was mentioning with the internship, it is um, held over two quarters. So in the fourth year of the program, students um, take three classes in the fall and in the winter and spring, they do an internship that's a minimum of 250 hours. So the 
really great part about that is they will leave us having had professional work experience in their field of interest that they can add to their resume. Uh, in terms of outcomes, 85% of our graduates obtain um, employment within six months of graduating. And in addition to that, a lot of our students just anecdotally report um, a good quality of life. We've had several alumni that actually get married to each other and make families together. And so we really do look at the student from a holistic point of view, but we understand that college is an investment and we want to um, our applicants and our families to understand that what the students are gonna be learning with us is a good use of time and it will equip them with skills that will help them to live really fulfilled um, lives that they can feel satisfied, uh, in which they can feel satisfied. In terms of logistics, um, our admission cycle is still open. So if you're interested in applying to OLS, um, please apply it by July 1st. That's our late deadline. And I know sometimes when I speak to parents at different events, like at Discovery Day at Bellevue College, they think, oh, well, I, I missed the general deadline. I, I don't I didn't make it in time and I'm going to be too late. No, absolutely. Please apply if you feel that um, you're interested in OLS. Um, our minimum requirements are on our website, so feel free to check those out there. But if there's anything that's unclear to understand, you know, um, by all means, email us at OLS at BellevueCollege.edu and we'll be happy to answer those questions. Um, Corbin, if you don't mind uh, switching to the next slide, um, separately from the OLS degree program is during the summer, we offer summer camps. And what the summer camps are is I, the way I explain it, it's kind of like a mini version of OLS. So they're a total of eight days. They're held over um, two weeks, Monday through Thursday, each week for three hours a day from nine to 12. And students learn um, skills for work. So they learn how, what their interests are. They learn what their strengths are. We use a model called dependable strengths. But alongside that, what, the, what we do is we take them on several tours of the Bellevue College campus to, um, to show them what we have to offer. So um, we've taken them to our theater. We have a, um, a theater department that's really active. We took them to our gym and I had a lot of fun with our students at the gym last summer. We got to check out the workout equipment and they got to see you know, what kind of a workout exercise equipment is available on a college campus. They get to check out the student dorms just to see like what, what they look like and what it's like to live there. So you'll notice that it's called skills for work, but there is also a strong component of understanding uh, what Bellevue College has to offer, what college life in general has to offer and what's available on campus. Um, those groups are filling up quite quickly. So um, in each group, we have a maximum of 15. And then our students, um, then after that, we have to start a waiting list and we are getting very close to having to start a waiting list. So if you're interested and you meet um, these three criteria that we have here on the poster, please feel free to apply and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all so much for your time. It was great to virtually meet you all. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to email us and we'll um, talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Justin. Okay. So, yeah, not to be confusing, but there's two programs at Bellevue College that are different. So we wanted to bring both um, kind of representatives from there. Okay. And then next I've got Brian, I think, scheduled here. I think you sent me stuff, right? Yes, you did. Okay. So we've got Brian Fouth. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself and... Um, but he works from at Cascadia College, and um, we've connected uh, through the transition program and other things and supporting kind of students at the college level. So I'll, I'll let Brian introduce himself, and I'll, I'll click away for you. Does that sound good? Awesome. Well, thank you, Corbin. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Foss. Use he, him pronouns, and I'm the... Director of Accessibility and Student Support Services at Cascadia College. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about accommodations at the college level for students with disabilities. So I think it looks great. Um, so, and this is, you know, obviously a little tailored to Cascadia College because I work at Cascadia, but also this can be applied to community colleges across the state, across the country, and also um, for universities as well, because all colleges have departments specifically designed to 
Uh, ensures students with disabilities have equal access to educational programs and campus services. Um, so these support departments, access departments, engage in an in interactive process to determine what accommodations are appropriate for each student. Accommodations are designed to eliminate barriers that have been created by inaccessible course content, policies, physical, um, inaccessible physical and digital spaces. Accommodations are, accommodations are determined on an individual basis. There are a variety of factors that are considered when accommodation is given to a student. Not every student's accommodation plan will be the same as others. Um, next slide, please, Corbin. So there are a couple of differences between accommodations in high school and accommodations in college. Um, in high school, school districts are required to identify students with different accessible needs, different disabilities and are required to provide services in accordance with federal and state laws. In college, um, colleges generally don't seek out students with disabilities, even though there's a lot of referrals that are made to our department from faculty and from academic advisors. Um, for students who might need accommodations, but overall the student is expected to register with a disability or access office. Um, and accommodations in college can be different from the ones in high school, um, such as that IEP and 504 plans are can be more focused on modifying the curriculum, where accommodations and college are focused on, um, you know, removing barriers caused by inaccessible policies. Um, you know, um, college accommodations cannot alter core standards. Um, and then in high school, outcomes, accommodations are determined by a team of educators, specialists, and family members, whereas in college, accommodations are determined usually when a student and a, um, a parent sometimes will meet with an accessibility advisor one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and they'll go through any documentation that a student has. Um, that could be an IEP, IEP plan, that could be a 504 plan, that could be a neuropsychologist report, any kind of medical documentation. And then based off that, it will be collaboration of what accommodations might be reasonable for that student. Next slide, Corbin. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of different barriers that are experienced by new, new students uh, transitioning the college with a disability. For some students, that initial transition after high school can be the hardest part of college. Um, because you don't have, you know, a support team that you had in high school and that you're expected to, you know, kind of do more of the advocacy piece by yourself. Um, all the students will face common barriers such as money, bureaucracy, uh, new system, new terminology, Students with disabilities experience unique barriers, which may include inaccessible campuses, inaccessible documents, and a medical model approach to disability. 
Um, you know, and then internal burrs can include negative self-talk, concerns about fitting in, um, you know, all kind of um hardships that I think a lot of, a lot of students experience when transitioning to a new school or a new system. So, you know, I think when a student is transitioning from high school to college, the best thing to do is register with any accommodation office at any college, probably before the they start at that college. Um, so if a student were transitioning to Cascadia College, we advise a student to register with um, us before the quarter begins by emailing our office and requesting an access meeting. Email is the best way to schedule an access meeting. Access meetings are where the student and myself will meet to discuss a student disability and medical condition or diagnosis. We'll identify barriers that may exist and together we'll determine possible accommodations through an interactive process. Even though um, we like to the students have documentation, uh, we don't require it. Um, you know, um, we, we trust the students' self-report and want to know what barriers they've experienced in design accommodations that way. Now, many accommodation offices have different documentation standards. Uh, so depending on which, co which college a student is going to, you want to check with that disability accommodation access office. Um, they all have different names depending on the school of what documentation they might need to set a student up with accommodations. And then, um, you know, services provided, uh, we serve a wide range of students with, you know, a uh, wide range of disabilities. That can be learning differences, mobility variations, neurological uh, conditions, speech and language differences, health, uh, uh, chronic health conditions, hearing and vision differences, and even temporary medical additions. Possible accommodations a student can receive are alternative testing, which is um, extended time on testing, and testing in a reduced refractive location, um, note-taking services, accessible textbooks, assistive technology devices, um, assistive technology software. So that can be text-to-speech uh, software, that can be software, uh, screen reading technology, ergonomic furniture in the classroom, ASL interpreters, and Accessibility management. Um, so accessibility management means, you know, a student may not know what accommodations they need in college, and that's fine. So we'll kind of continue to work with the student to, you know, identify what accommodations they might need as they go through that first quarter. Um, because high school is very different from college and we want to make sure that we are um, listening to the students experiences and uh, advising them on the on the most appropriate accommodations that they need for equal access
And then here's our contact info. Um, so we are located in Cadet Corner in Cascade College, which is like the central location for student services. Um, I'll wear a phone, email, and uh, I uh, appreciate everyone's time. Uh, and if there are any questions about Cascadia, about the accommodation process at Cascadia, the accommodation process in general, please feel free to contact us. We're happy to answer any questions about anything. And uh, yeah, thank you for the time I did. A minute late as my alarm went off, but I uh, appreciate your time. No worries. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Again, Brian is from Cascadia College and the Accessibility and Support Services Office. And I'm going to unshare. We've got one more um, resource here, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to either pop in our breakout rooms or let people ask some questions. So we've got Diana, and okay, should be good. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Rowe George, and um, yeah, I'm sharing about Pursuit today uh, at Edmonds College. Um, it focuses on belonging, discovering strengths, self advocacy, our peer mentorship work, and work preparedness and soft skills. This is something that we've been about since 2018, um, and we have been a pre-employment transition service. So many of you guys might have heard about us through um, Holly, who is uh, Holly Montana, who's from your area. But basically, I'm the director of a program called Pursuit, which is um, Prius. And we are funded by the Department of uh, Vocational Rehabilitation um, in Washington. And um, I just wanted to tell you a quick story about one of our students uh, to start, because I know that stories are what matters for a lot of you. But um, Jeffrey, like many of our students who come to our program, was lacking a lot of career direction, low job confidence, lacking self-advocacy and initiative, and basically facing post-secondary life, um, not knowing how to navigate pathways. And as a lot of groups shared here earlier, um, I think just trying to help students um, gain these skills to be more successful in these pathways. So it is not new to you all to uh, realize that there are not only a high number of people with disabilities in our country, but the employment challenges that are there. But specifically, I just wanted to name a self-advocacy need that um, highlights why this pre-employment transition service grant was created. It's a federal grant. Um, as you see here on the last bullet point, 94% of students with learning disabilities had some kind of help in high school. But when they got to the college setting or post-secondary setting, only 17% of them um, were receiving services. And so just like our, um, our Brian, who was sharing about accommodations, um, getting that access is why our program came into existence at Edmonds. And as well as Brian's, um, I think, accommodations um, department also wants to do that as well. Um, our specific grant, which is a pre-employment transition and service, exists because of that um, equity gap that the government sees for so much of its population. So what they did was they researched to find out what age group is the most significant age group to address um, needs for self-advocacy and workplace readiness. And they found it to be 14 to 21 year old students with some type of disability. So I don't know if you know this, but under pre-employment transition services, your student can get up to 120 hours of workplace readiness training, 120 hours of self-advocacy training, unlimited work-based learning activities, as well as 40 to 120 hours of paid and unpaid internships every 12 months between their ages of 14 and 21. Um, the internships only apply to 16 and older due to labor laws, but this is something that you can access for free because the government is funding your students to be able to access these services so that they can close this equity gap and the employment gap that you saw on the slides earlier. Um, so I'm just trying to get through this so that you guys can ask your questions, but Edmonds College, we have three tiers of services. Our first one is we give job site tours and school-based workshops where people like Stephen, who's in this uh, meeting as well, offers school-based workshops um, that go to the high schools. But the thing that we've done since the very beginning is our Edmonds-based workshops. We have these 10 days to five week 
intensives every quarter of the year. And these are all offered for free to your students, um, as well as these paid and unpaid internships. And students from tier one and tier two filter into our third tier of paid and unpaid internships. And I just wanted to talk to you guys about some of the opportunities we have this summer. So these are, um, I have the slides here, I think in the chat. So let me just see if I can make sure I get those to you. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna move forward. Um, what is um, a five week or 10 week intensive? Um, something that's very unique about Edmonds is that we are a group pre-ex. So it's for students with disabilities who are interested in pursuing jobs college and career goals. We always have the saying, what are you pursuing today that's helping you get you where you want to be tomorrow? So that's what we're helping them with, their next steps. So we have 13, it's actually up to much more than that, um, I think 17 this year, um, separate opportunities for online and in-person for your students. I want to emphasize we are not a replacement for a transition program. Or, nor are we a job placement like ProVail or different organizations. We are not wraparound services like the K-12 services that Corbin Young works for. Um, it is like an elective class that your student can take. And we've had uh, classes um, or students from the North Shore School District. And um, we um, like to consider ourselves like a mini campus or college ex immersion experience as like a college class. Um, and uh, we can get connected through your RTC, you can get connected to us through your RTCs or directly to us. Um, since 2020, we've been uh, doing fully virtual options. Uh, we were very successful. That student I told you about, um, Jeffrey, at the very beginning of these slides, he um, was uh, somebody who um, joined us in 2020, got these employability and life skills overcoming obstacles, interview skills, and building a resume. Um, we help students really focus on their strengths as well as just what is their career direction. Um, and um, he was able to discover that he really loved choreography. And um, something that we have found that many students discover in this space is like a sense of belonging with the different people here because they all have some type of disability. And we found that even during the pandemic, we had just as high as participation as we did in person. And those outcomes are very similar. And um, something that we hope for our students is what um, was the case for Jeffrey, which was that he gained not only these skills and took them to one of his favorite uh, drama clubs that he participated in. And he asked them, did you hire me? And so he did an interview. He gave them the resume he created through our class. And they gave him an apprenticeship that he um, got um, invited back to, his friends got invited to, and now we have a subcontract with them. So Dandelion Drama is one of the internships that we uh, partner with and place a student every quarter of the year. But uh, this is from his mother, and I've gotten a permission to share about how it impacted him. Um, she posted this on one of our articles about our program, and he has now uh, working in um, Trader Joe's, doing a really successful job in that placement. But this Dandelion Drama organization actually offered him a full-time position once he uh, once they go back um, to uh, in-person classes in the elementary schools. And um, getting support um, from him as a teaching assistant would be something that they would love to do. So this is what we hope for when it comes to our, uh, our students being able to gain these job skills and going out pursuing them on their own. Um, but just to clarify, our program serves 14 to 21 year old students with any type of documented disability, it could be IEP 504 or medically diagnosed, uh, but they need to manage their condition independently, especially in a group setting, um, if they're gonna be in person, but also on Zoom, they can get the support from a parent. Um, so um, we have typical students on here, but you can come talk to me or Steven at our, at our um, program or contact us through our contact information here to find out whether or not this is a good fit. Um, we find that a lot of people who participate in our internships have a higher chance of getting um, employment offers after, and that's why a lot of these programs are offering that. Um, our hope is, uh, for just like Jeffrey, is to help equip them to not only help them understand and own their strengths, but continue to pursue strength building opportunities. We found it to be very effective for students who are even 14 um, and high school age, because once they kind of have that honing of their compass, then they keep, can keep on building their resume even before they get to the college or post-secondary setting. So we'd really love to have you guys. The way to access us is through this pre-employment transition service approval form. And basically that first page is um, filled out by you um, and signed by the parent. 
um, if you can do it with your student, but it's signed by the parent if the student is um, younger than 18. Um, but if they're older than 18, they can sign. But Section 2 needs to be signed by an employee of their current um, place of school. So a school employee that knows that their IEP or 504. So that is needed to be able to access all these services that we're offering for free. So what are we doing this summer? It's a really exciting opportunity. And I'm going to drop our flyers and different things here into the chat. Um, but um, basically, um, our summer opportunities include um, three different sessions of job readiness and communication. And because of this grant um, through uh, the government, we're actually able to offer this for free. And uh, as you can see, there are morning times, 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. or 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. for every session, the first session being job readiness and communication, second session being strength and reference building, third session being overcoming obstacles and self-determination. And this is something that is um, really helpful uh, for students who want to continue to attend um, for like as they build on each one of these. Um, a really cool aspect of what we're doing uh, for this summer is that we're partnering with our continuing education department that has youth tech camps running. And they're gonna be for younger students, only $199 for four day, five day camps um, on campus. And they're running at the exact same times as our camps. And the reason why we designed it that way is if your student is 16 or older, um, we are actually hiring interns for these youth camps. So you could pair your um, your summer camp classes with us. You could take a class with us in the morning, and then you could do four hours of an internship, if that's um, something that your student has the capacity for, or you could just do the internship, or you could just do the class. But you could spend a full day on the Edmonds College campus from 9 a.m. to 4, uh, taking classes and uh, doing a paid internship. We pay minimum wage, but we have about 20 spots that we're trying to fill we have so far about 10 applicants and we're hoping to fill the rest of those before the end of May, May 30th, thir sorry, May 31st is our deadline where students need to turn in their pre its form, fill out this QR code here, as well as um, turn in teacher recommendation. This information is all found on our website and we'd love for you guys to get a chance to get connected to that. But um, yeah, if you guys have any other questions um, I am dropping our flyer here into the chat as well. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to wrap up so you guys can get a chance to um, get into small groups. I really just encourage you guys are all amazing uh, advocates for our students. Um, please share about our program and all the other wonderful programs that were shared about before. This is where you can find us. If you're an employer, I really would love to partner with you to help um, bring this funding uh, from this federal grant to be able to hire our students um, with the funding available through uh, the pre grant. So come talk to me, I'd love to connect. Um, but yeah, that's it, thanks guys. Okay, thank you, Dana. Breakout rooms, and I'll just put them by number and I, I know not everybody's still hanging around here. Um, and then I'll just have a few just open um, if anybody's like, you know, uh, has a question and wants to pop in. Um, <clears throat> as I'm just looking at some of the, is there a place to review this information later? Yes, I will share the slides and this video will be posted um, after kind of download it and look at it, but it'll be shared out as well. Let me, does anybody have any general questions while I make the the breakout rooms here. Okay, I try to just open some by category. So we've got one kind of that's anybody left from school to work and DVR. Um, I, I think I saw Laura still on here from Melissa Burnett Center. But maybe Laura slipped off. Um, she said she had to leave. Oh, no worries. <laughs> uh, and then I have a room for some of the colleges and then um i've also have a room for the arc and then like i said i'll have some open ones if people want to talk privately about or have some questions but it's totally optional to jump in any of these breakout rooms 
So people can stick around or anybody has have any other. Have you opened them yet? I think I did for college. Yeah. So you should be able to jump into the college one, Sarah. I'm not seeing them. I think you have to click the breakout rooms icon at the bottom. Oh, okay. Thank you. Corbin, do you want to stop sharing your PowerPoint? Yeah. We can see that. Sorry about that. Okay.